Always nice to close out a good conference. Hopefully you've all had a really good time here. I think that they've done an excellent job putting this together. Um, I want to talk to you today about general purpose data center automation. One of the things that we run into at SALT is that my slides aren't advancing. <laughs> what I want to talk to you today about is um, how we view automation inside of SALT. Now, generally, when people think about SALT, they think about SALT in the context of configuration management. This is far and away the dominant view. Um, and perception that SALT receives is that of a configuration management tool. But SALT is very much so four very distinct things. And I feel very strongly that these things need to come together. This is, yeah, Dave, can I try your laptop? <laughs> that these things come together to create a next generation automation suite. And so these four aspects of SALT stack are the remote execution component of SALT, which is its foundation, followed by the configuration management system in SALT, and then the cloud management systems in SALT, and then most importantly, and really what I think our crowning jewel is, is our event system inside of SALT and the, re the event reactor system. So when Dave Boucher here, um, second salt stack employee, one of our core engineers, saving my bacon, hopefully. <laughs> okay. One of the main things that we have seen over the last few years with the advent of DevOps and automation inside of infrastructures is the growing complexity of the application stack and the infrastructure themselves. One of my favorite exa examples of this is I was talking to a major bank, um, and they said that since they started using SALT, previously it was all manual, they switched from having five applications being deployed by a small team to 50 applications being deployed by a small team. And this is a story that we see happen over and over again, very common. And the hallmark there was that it wasn't, a it wasn't consolidation. It wasn't an act of them saying, well, hey, we have automation now. We can get rid of people. It was an act of them saying, we have automation. We can, we can do more. We can deploy more. We can manage more. And so the fundamental aspect, it seemed, of automation is that we increase our complexity. Because all of a sudden, we as individuals can do more. Anyone good at their job doesn't automate them out of an existence and then just keep pushing the button until they die. They say, what more can I automate? And so what is the end result of this? The end result of this is that we get higher levels of complexity inside of our infrastructure. Sure, it may seem less complex because of our automation tools, but we do keep growing that fundamental complexity. And the other thing to keep in mind when we look at complexity in an infrastructure, has to do with the fact that we're continually not only responsible for server infrastructure anymore. And we are, okay, this isn't my laptop. This totally is not my fault anymore. <laughs> it's <laughs> blameless postmortem. Oh, I didn't say it was blameless. So I'm just saying it. I'm just going to pull a Han Solo and say it's not my fault. Okay, one of the other things that we're seeing inside of infrastructures is more and more devices that need to be managed, a greater diversity of devices that need to be managed as we enter into the Internet of Things and we enter into um, using DevOps style approaches and tools for network management, storage management, etc. And so as, the, as complexity increases, the question is, is how do we automate that complexity? How do we deal with that complexity? And I'm, I'm getting to the point where I really need a slide. <laughs> okay. 
So what I want to do is talk about the history of IT automation and where it's come from. Recently, there's been a lot more to do about um, the, or the orchestration of an infrastructure. Oh, ah. Thank you. Okay, so this is a slide for what I was just trying to talk about. <laughs> All right, so as we have increased complexity in our application stacks, we also have com increased complexity in size of the infrastructure, as well as many more interfaces, applications that we use. Containers are great, but in many of the deployments that we see, there are hybrid deployments with containers and not containers and bare metal and hybrid cloud, public cloud, private cloud, and we find it very rare that somebody has had a really tight, honed, single mechanism deployment, and mostly because, as we know, that doesn't work for very well when we have a really diverse set of applications and databases and requirements, okay? All right. So, right, as things become more complex because of automation, we have more complexity because we've been able to create that complexity. All right. Now, one of the things that we're known to do really well is scale. We've got um, one of our largest, one of the largest salt deployments in the world is managing um, into the millions of servers, okay? And so I was asked recently, how do you define large? When we look at something that's large, there are multiple vectors that we need to evaluate. It is not only the physical number of systems that we need to interface with, but it also has everything to do with the number of applications that are deployed on those systems. And so when we look at managing, when we look at managing things, this is, this is, I've never had this many distractions and problems during a talk. <laughs> this, is, this is really challenging. It's, I'm just, I've, I've just said nuts to the fourth wall. <laughs> You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> okay. The argument that I'm trying to, trying to present is that the classical mechanisms of orchestration and automation need to be reassessed when it comes to looking at highly complex and, high and extremely large infrastructures, where we have very complex rule sets and a lot of servers and applications that are being deployed. Okay. Now, I've got a saying that I, that I say around the office. I say there is no such thing as revolution. There is only evolution. And then I go through great pains to cite revolutions in history as to why they were really evolutions. We can look back at the American Revolution and we can say this was really just another step in evolving towards mechanisms of and exposure of political freedoms because much of that had already existed in England and that this was also why many of the democracies that came out of Europe, where serfdom was only more recently being abolished, were much harder to, uh, to emerge. And so similarly in technology, we evolved very, very quickly, and, so, and oftentimes it feels revolutionary. But as many of you know, most of the concepts and usage that we have is an evolution of older concepts and ideas. I've heard numerous people joke that uh, if you want to make a startup today, you should just pull out a mainframe manual from 1980 and see what's missing on the market. So if it isn't, evol if it isn't revolution, then, what are, then we should look at, from an automation perspective, what are we evolving from? What is behind us with respect to how we automate systems? Now. Automation of IT systems focuses very closely on a concept which we refer to as linear orchestration. The idea of linear orchestration is that we have a series of steps 
which need to occur, and we watch those steps one after another in sequence. <clears throat> Runbook orchestration is also very much this thing, right? The problem that we run into is that when we have these linear sequences, oftentimes they can't step on each other. These linear sequences um, also need to be run one after another, and they can take an immense amount of time to run. So the question becomes, have we capped out with what we can do with linear orchestration mechanisms? And so I thought, if we need to evolve from existing concepts, and if I feel that the history of IT automation is a little dry on the subject, then where can we look and learn about how to do automation which is complex with respect to size and rule sets? And so this is where I went back to my experience working with automation inside of the uh, US Navy. The automation that they use inside of naval vessels and submarines is dramatically different from what we use inside of data centers. And nothing like it has really been adapted to how a data center works. Everything that they do inside of these robotics style automation systems have to do with a number of components around events, execution, um, open ability to define the flow of the execution, and most importantly, this concept of a reactor, okay? And so, looking at it from this perspective, and saying, how do robotic systems work? And how do um, distributed computation systems work? Because robotics, of course, generally has the benefit of just being inside one system. Swarm robotics is a little newer. And is there a way to combine the concepts from robotics and distributed systems in such a way to create a highly performant distributed automation system which is usable and doesn't sacrifice any of the functionality that you actually need to run, okay? Now, actually, I'm gonna go back and talk a little more. A couple of the main concepts that we see inside of distributed systems has to do with determining, the dis determining um, or distributing information asynchronously. Asynchronous communication is an extremely important part of distributed systems. Um, asynchronous communication is also an extremely important part of being able to send messages out at large scale. And then when we come back and we look at the robotics, an event-driven approach is very, very important. We have to be able to look at sensors and information as it comes in and then decide what tasks are going to execute based on the influx of information instead of looking at it from, again, that runbook perspective, okay? There's a number of techniques that they use in robotics to do this. Um, one of them that I'm particularly fond of is something called flow programming. Flow programming says that you have a rule set which changes its execution based on what data has become available. And so that as data enters into the system, the execution of the system changes and modifies. Flow programming is actually one of the core principles behind SALT's configuration management runtime. Although I don't talk about it as much in that context because people are less interested until I start talking about robotics and event-driven components. And so this is where this concept of an event-driven automation system comes into play. Event-driven automation means that we are receiving events from multiple places, taking those events, and then just making decisions based upon them. It also, though, means that we have the means to have many parallel management operations happening at the same time in a very smooth, seamless, cooperative way. It makes it very easy for systems to wait in an asynchronous way until the time is right for them to self-modify or until, more accurately, the data 
is available for them to modify themselves, okay? Another thing that's very, very important about this is the concept of integrating monitoring into your management system, okay? Now, the challenge that I think also that we generally see is the perspective at which we approach a problem. The perspective of, at which I have approached the problem of event-driven automation is being fully aware of the fact that I need to be able to manage and monitor the systems before I can start tagging in event-driven components, okay? And so we need a number of building blocks to facilitate an event-driven automation scenario. And those building blocks are that we need the ability to execute arbitrary routines, we need the ability to gather events and monitoring data from endpoints. We need the ability to apply item potent, um, sorry, make item potent application to the systems which we are managing. Um, and we need to be deeply integrated with uh, not only the way that the system is managed, but other sources of events and other systems that we need to uh, integrate with beyond, again, just a server. And so when we look at this, we need integrations with monitoring tools. We need integrations with um, cloud event systems. We need integrations with um, tools like New Relic and uh, information that's getting us aggregate data so that we can feed all of that back in to the last and most important component of event-driven uh, automation, and that is the reactor system. Now, there are a number of different designs that we can, design approaches that we can take when making a reactor. So just to kind of recap and make sure that we're on the same page, I'm throwing out a lot of different concepts to try and make something cohesive, is that we need the, we basically need the tools to control a system and we need a tools, the tools to gather information from systems so that that reactor system is able to go out and make decisions and make legitimate and real changes and that it's able to get the information that it cares the most about, okay? And then the reactor is the thing that sits on top. Now, there are, an, again, a number of different designs of reactors, but there's two basic designs that I want to talk about. So a simple reactor or a single event reactor is one where the reactor is programmed to wait for a single event to be piped back up to it. As soon as that event is received, it says, oh, that's a special event that I'm waiting for, so I will trigger a reaction. The benefit of this reactor is that it's incredibly easy to learn, it's incredibly easy to understand, Programming this type of reactor is uh, really, really just a cakewalk. And it can still be extremely powerful. So, for instance, we see um, the single event reactor inside of SALT being used in environments with tens of thousands of servers and hundreds and hundreds of applications just waiting to, to hear that a certain logic chain has reached the next level, certain information has become available, and then it can instantly send out the next phases without needing either the human interaction um, or without needing larger groups of systems to come to a certain level of consensus before it can move forward. All of the components can be chopped up into much smaller pieces. Okay. Now, the other type of reactor is an aggregate event base, is an aggregate of reactor, okay? An aggregate reactor is able to listen to many events come in and then determine, based on large event sets, whether or not certain thresholds have been met, whether or not certain conditions have been met, etc. The benefits of these types of reactors is that it allows us to use um, artificial intelligence techniques and machine learning techniques to make those decisions. The other benefit of these types of reactors is that it allows us to deal with substantially more complex cases. 
with a single event reactor, it gets very challenging to say that I'm going to, say, start doing auto scaling, or I'm going to make a determination based on machine learning style input. Whereas an aggregate event reactor is able to handle, again, those more complex cases. Some of the problems, of course, with the aggregate event reactor is that programming them in such a way that um, they're understandable can be more challenging. So inside of SALT, we ship with both of these types of reactors. The single event reactor has been around since 2013 and was introduced in an extremely early, dangerously early version of SALT. Um, that reactor has since gone on and is used in thousands of installs around the world to do very complex tasks, okay? Some of, uh, some of my favorites are uh, when it was originally implemented uh, at Wikipedia to be able to listen to events and kick off their continuous deployment systems so that it was able to wait for builds to finish and then automate continuous deployment. Um, it's used heavily at uh, companies like LinkedIn to do automatic data filtering so that all of the events come in, the reactor then filters them back into remote locations, okay? As well as uh, being able to trigger auto healing routines, okay? The thorium reactor is something that, that was introduced earlier this year in SALT. This is SALT's aggregate reactor, okay? It's very, very new and experimental, and it is a very challenging problem, we've learned. <laughs> and it took me, took me a little more time on research than I originally anticipated. Uh, but the thorium reactor introduces a full flow programming language that can be used to create robotics-style reactions and robotics-style logic. The entire language is implemented in the same set that we use for SALT's configuration management system. So anyone who uses SALT's configuration management system instantly is familiar with the syntax method and methodology of this complex thorium reactor, okay? Both of these reactors use SALT as the command backend. So again, it goes back into the concept of we need to have item potent configuration and management, which is SALT's configuration management system. But we also need to have one-off change ability and one-off query ability. The ability to reach out and say, hey, I need to know this one thing for the next event to be able to react to it. Or I need to make this one-off change. Okay. The other thing that's very important that both of these systems use inside of SALT, because SALT, of course, ships with its own event bus, is a system we introduced last year called Beacons. So earlier I was talking about the importance of integrating all of these components together so that we were able to have the same unified system generate the events and send it across the pipe and still be able to react and manage it. And so the beacon system was introduced in SALT last, early last year, which allows us to have monitoring routines directly embedded inside of our existing agents and allows us to tightly couple those monitoring routines with complex reactions, okay? So the end result is that we are able to get an event-driven automation style system. We've got the benefit of SALT's vast array of integrations into um, both servers across multiple operating systems, Internet of Things devices, some of my, some of my favorite examples of uh, uh, usage of the event-driven uh, paradigm can be found in weather stations in South Africa that use SALT for all of their management and also for piping all of the actual weather data back over the, bus, over the SALT bus. Um, so we, we definitely have integration in the IoT space, uh, but also networking. One of our best uh, networking customers, which uses SALT extensively, and again, in 
this event-driven automation fashion is Cloudflare. So all of their uh, switches, et cetera, are being managed through this paradigm. So again, very, very far-reaching in its capabilities with that model in place. OK. This is, this is a concept that we haven't talked about as much um, from SaltStack. A lot of our emphasis over the years has been on our configuration management and remote execution systems. Um, and we're just now starting to come out and talk more about the event-driven automation components of Salt. And mostly because we wanted to make sure that they were well-baked. Um, we wanted to make sure that what we were talking about was well-established, and we wanted to also get a good grasp of what the real world use cases of these systems are. And so I am very happy to be able to say that this is a very real thing, that we have many, many, many deployments uh, which are using an event-driven automation paradigm today. And that that is fundamentally how we approach the problem of large. Because something that is large is not just big because you've got a lot of servers. It's large because you have a lot of logical complexity overlaid on a lot of servers, services, and devices. And that intricate dance is something which should be handled in a unified way. OK. I've ended a little early, like it. And, and had a terribly rocky talk. I'm, I'm really embarrassed. And I'm being taped and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, you've got this evolutionary step. Are there any future evolutionary steps on your mind? Um, definitely. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is that we've just introduced this new reactor paradigm. And a lot of the work that we're focusing on is making making the logic and determination inside that reactor more distributed, um, and opening up that reactor to deal with even a broader set of devices. And so the demand that we're getting from our customers and users is going up dramatically to be able to create um, logic systems which are able to determine things around, say, storage management between cold storage and high performance hot storage, things of that nature. Um, we've got a lot of questions around how, or a lot of work around how the system can also be applied to dynamic uh, network configuration so that we're able to do things like uh, on the fly reactive SDN modification. Um, we've got a few customers that are playing around with that right now, um, but definitely looking forward along those lines. Um, uh, let's see. There's, uh, there's another concept that's really, really new I don't, uh, that, that we're playing around with around making um, completely morphic uh, management systems so that uh, so the very nature of the demons and processes that are managing your systems are fundamentally flexible uh, so that they automatically mold to whatever their environment is. Um, so the management system itself becomes kind of part of the integral event-driven mechanism. Um, but that's, that's way too young at this point for me to say anything more finite, finite about. But yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, if there's no other questions, thanks.